Good morning, church. Good morning. morning. Victory in Jesus. That's what we have. Amen. Amen to that. I always say that the Christians are the most happy people on earth. You know why? You know why? Because we have victory in Jesus. <laughs> you can never be wrong with Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay, so this morning, again, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. All right. <laughs> this morning, we will be talking about defending the faith. We will focus our attention on the existence of God. Does God exist? And you know, it's, this is a, uh, uh, a question that's uh, often asked. And uh, as we go on, uh, Lord willing, this will be a series of uh, lessons about defending our faith, defending God, defending Jesus Christ. And we will uh, answer some of the, the questions being thrown at us and uh, we will try to answer it uh, within the context of the Bible, the absolute truth. Now, it has always been argued that God doesn't exist, right? And uh, if he exists, what's the proof? What is our proof? Now, I will be presenting some of the common arguments about it and um, present an answers from number one, theological point of view, number two, from uh, the field of science, and number three, from well-known atheists, even from atheists, we will try to see what they have to say about it. And number four, uh, we will try to answer it from perhaps common sense, right? So, <clears throat> the problem in believing in God is what I call the basic human senses test. I can't see God. I don't believe him. I can't hear God. I can't hear talk. I can't hear him talking. I can't touch God. I can smell God, and I cannot taste God. So, those things are some of the arguments that uh, people wanted to um, to throw at us, and they wanted to see God. They wanted me to show them God. Though in the Old Testament, there's a ton of evidence that they heard God and they even saw God. Though not his face, but his back. We can read that in Exodus chapter 33, verses 22 to 23. Then I will take my hand away, and this was, uh, God was talking to Moses. Then I will take my hand away, and you will see my back. But my face must not be seen. So some people today want to see God physically to believe God. But I'm telling you, that's not going to happen. right? Now, the first thing that we would try to answer is that creation demands a creator. Now, in Romans chapter, two, chapter 1, verse 20, that was read to us a while ago, the evidence of creation. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from His workmanship, so that men are without excuse. Of course, those who don't believe in God, they will not believe and accept this proof. So, what does this verse tell us? Now, because of the creation, the entire universe, universe is defined as everything that is existing today, including ourselves. So, everything that we see now, we see God's power and God's divine nature. Although we cannot see God, but through the creation, through everything that God created, using our basic senses, somehow we can see God. Look around you. Look around you. Look at the people around you. Look around you. Look 
around you. You see how beautiful you are, right? Of course, I'm so handsome. <laughs> ask my, my mom. Don't ask my daughter. <laughs> She'll tell you, no, you're pangit. And that's a Tagalog word for not handsome. <laughs> but you ask my mom, he will t uh, she will tell you that I am very handsome. Now, there was this young boy. A young boy was discussing with his father one time about his lesson uh, regarding how the earth was formed. And uh, his teacher told him that uh, the universe was created through what is so-called the Big Bang Theory. Maybe you heard of that. And uh, uh, it includes himself. So everything was created through that Big Bang Theory. And uh, the teacher said, and the boy was wondering, uh, my teacher told me that it came from nothing. So the boy was kind of wondering uh, th that thought. So he was thinking, how could something come from nothing, okay, considering the vastness of the universe? So the teacher said it was possible through science. Now, many days after, they went to this uh, exhibit, an art exhibit, particularly painting exhibit. And the boy noticed a, uh, a tag on each painting. So there was a tag. And the boy asked the teacher, um, what are the tags for? And th there are names on that tag. So the teacher said, well, that's the name of the painter who painted that painting. So the boy said, ma'am, so the paintings demand a painter to the amusement of his teacher. Now, in the beginning, there was nothing, as they say. There was nothing. Everybody believed that there was nothing. No universe. Then all of a sudden, there was a massive explosion of an extremely hot bubble that was a thousand times smaller than a pinhead. Can you imagine a pinhead? A thousand times smaller than a pinhead. Can you even see that? No. no. So they say that there was a hot bubble, extremely hot bubble, that was a thousand times smaller than a pinhead. And after the explosion, ergo, the universe was born. Everything that there is today, including you and I. Now, they call this the Big Bang Theory. But until today, this theory remains a theory. It's not yet proven, right? So the question remains, where did the energy come from? And how did this thousand times smaller than a pinhead particle or speck of a matter come about? If they say it came from this, it came from that, so the next question would be, the logical question would be, where did this, this and that come from? And if they say, well, this came from this and that came from that. So the next logical question again would be, where does this, this and that come from? So it is a never ending question of where it come from, right? It does not make you, it doesn't need, you don't need to be a scientist, you know, to, to have that logic, right? So, it says that okay, the scientific evidence points to a unique event in the history of the universe, its creation. Yet, the mechanism of this event cannot be explained through science. So that's why until now, it remains to be a theory. It hasn't proven yet. What is the alternative? So they've given an alternative. The alternative is a creator God. According to Creation Demands, a creator website. Now the Bible tells us a plain in plain, simple words, that 
everybody can understand, even the youngest here can understand that everything came from God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It tells us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Again, what's the alternative? A creator God. Now, interestingly, science got it right when they said that there was nothing in the beginning. Because in verse 2, the Bible tells us, Now the earth was formless and empty, nothing. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. At least in that part, when they said there was nothing in the beginning, they were right. There was really nothing in the beginning. But the problem arises when all of a sudden, this tiny speck of a matter appeared. And then, boom, everything was created. Okay. Now, creation demands a creator suggesting that this universe could not have just created itself. Okay. And uh, it could have not come from nothing. Like the painting in our story, the painting could have not painted itself. Somebody outside that painting painted that painting. The same thing, some being, a bigger being, an intelligent being outside of the universe created everything. Right? Now, has it ever crossed your mind why at the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1.1, the first sentence is, let's go back. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Why is it that the beginning of the Bible, this is what's written. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. My thought is that the first thing that God wants you and I, wants mankind to know, is that He is sovereign. At the first part, when you open your Bible, in the very beginning, God introduced himself to you. That he is powerful. That he is sovereign. That he created you. Now, this is the first evidence of his sovereignty. This means, remember the three omnis. This means that God is what? Omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. Meaning that God is all-powerful that he created the entire universe. So before anything else, before anything else, before you could go to other verses and other chapters in the Bible, at the very beginning, God introduces himself to us that he is the all-powerful. Now a seeker of the truth, for that matter, who wants to know who God is, should start reading and understanding Genesis 1, 1. And uh, he will know right off the bat who God is. That God is sovereign. Now God created everything out of nothing. Now do you want to see how powerful our God is? Genesis 1, 3 and 9. Just an example. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And in verse 9, and God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. Have you noticed the word, and God said, and God said, and God said, and it was so, and it was so. What does it mean? It means God created everything through his word. By just merely speaking, by saying, everything was created. And that's how powerful our God is. Now he was like, okay, let the trees grow in this side. And it was so. Let the four-legged animals grow in this side. And it was so. By just speaking, uttering the words, God created everything. Nobody can do that except our God. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Now, Again, another point, in Job chapter 26, verse 7, it is he who spreads out the north over emptiness and hangs 
the earth on nothing. When Isaac Newton discovered gravity way back, the world of science began to understand that the gravitational pull, this is the sun, that the gravitational pull of the sun to the earth is what makes the earth orbit around it and what makes the earth hang on nothing in space. That's what science uh, taught us. Now you see, before science even found that out, the God of the Bible, your God, my God, already said it. See? He held it in place with his power. Okay? It's hanging on nothing, like the Bible said, and hangs the earth on nothing. Science just confirmed it. All right? So that's how powerful our God is. Again, science believed something came from nothing. I believe it was last year of March 20 that um, physicists and great thinkers, they came together in the American Museum of Natural History in New York to debate the concept of nothing. So they come together and debate the concept of nothing. And they said, according to uh, LibScience.com, the simple idea of nothing, a concept that even toddlers, toddlers can understand. So they come together to define what is nothing. So even toddlers could understand. So the simple idea of nothing, a concept that even toddlers can understand, proved surprisingly difficult for scientists to pin down with some of them questioning whether such a thing is as nothing exists at all. So even the great minds of today were having problems coming to terms in defining what is nothing. What is nothing? Now the host of the, uh, the, host of the event even said, and I quote, maybe nothing will never be resolved. Now, if they want a definition of the word nothing, that even toddlers, that even the smallest, I mean, the youngest uh, individual here could understand, maybe nothing simply means nothing. <laughs> right? It can never be simpler than that. Nothing is simply nothing. Now, next, for something to come about, any matter demands a maker. There must be something. There must be a cause that causes that matter okay, to appear. And in science, they call that the cause or causality effect. Cause or causality means that all effects, all outcome, must have a specific physical causes due to fundamental interactions. Okay. Now, everything that has a beginning as a cause. Everything. It didn't come from nothing. Now, something cannot really come from nothing. Now, a, a well-known uh, biologist by the name of Richard Dawkins, a zoologist and a science communicator, is an author and also an atheist, trying to explain that something came from nothing, surprisingly said, he said, and this guy is an atheist, and he's a, uh, uh, a well-known scientist. Of course, common sense doesn't allow you to get something from nothing. You see, he even said those words. That's why it's interesting, it's got to be interesting, in order to give, to give rise to the universe at all, something pretty mysterious had to give rise to the origin of the universe. Of course, common sense doesn't allow you to get something from nothing. But he believed that something came from nothing. And during the debate, okay, during that debate with Cardinal George Pell in 2012, he said those words in live uh, television, in a debate. Okay. Now, causality, it tells us that matter or something cannot create itself. There must be a cause. Okay. A matter is not eternal. 
Eternal means has no beginning, has no end. And that tiny, small speck of a matter, a thousand times smaller than the pinhead, then it just suddenly appear. There should be a cause for that to appear. Outside of that, make it appear. And for this universe to appear, there should be some being outside of it to make it appear. Something that is eternal or something that is powerful. Now the Bible points us to an eternal God. In Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or over you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. What does it mean from everlasting to everlasting? God is eternal. It means God has no beginning and has no end. So therefore, it only makes sense that the universe didn't come from nothing. It came from God. And Genesis 1-1 tells us God created everything. Now, the only way to explain how the very first thing came to be is because of an eternal God. Now, another lesson to believe in God's existence is that life cannot come, or life can only come from life. Life cannot come from non-life, which therefore means life demands a life giver. Let me repeat. Life cannot come from non-life. Life could only come from life, right? Animal life can only come from life. Vegetation, plant life can only come from life. Human life can only come from life. And guess what? Even bacteria can only come from life. It cannot come from non-life. So again, life demands a life giver. This means that there must be an existing or previously existing life that gave their life. All right? Now, also, animals, you know, cannot come from plant life. Plant life cannot come from animal life. Human life cannot come from animal life. It should come from its own kind. Now, the question again is where does this all types of life come from? Where did they begin? Now, a rational explanation would be it comes from an intelligent being, alive and active. Now, this points us to the existence of an eternal God. This points us to the, to the existence of an all-powerful life, of all-powerful God, a life giver. Now, the creation account in Genesis proves that all life forms came from a living God, not from a non-life matter or energy that suddenly appeared and exploded. And voila, everything appeared. Doesn't make sense. And this life, the life that God gave to all of us, came all life forms thereafter. In Genesis 1, 11, 12, when he, God created everything, the earth produced vegetation, seed-bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed according to their kinds. And God saw it was good. Genesis 1, 21, 22, when God created the great sea creatures and every living thing that moves according to their kinds, and every bird of flight after its kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them and said, Be, be fruitful and multiply. Now, it was the same with livestock, with all four-legged animals, with, uh, with uh, um, land crawlers. And it was also the same with us humans. God created everything according to its kind. And they multiplied according to its kind. Now, with humans, God said, go. God blessed humans, and he said, be fruitful and multiply. So life could only come from life, and from its own kind as God planned it from the very beginning. 
So again, human life can only come from human life. Land life from plant life. Animal life from animal life. So life can only come from life. And life could not come from non-life. Louis Pasteur, a well-known scientist, believed life can only exist from life. Francis Collins, a world-famous geneticist and self-described obnoxious atheist, in his academic days was converted to Christianity and he stood by Bill Clinton's side in 1990. As the president announced, today we are learning the language in which God created life. Francis Collins embraced God. Now next is that the universe, if you would look at the universe, if you will study the universe, it's so complex. Scientists are still baffled by the universe. You know, they still wanted to find out many things about the universe because it's really so complex. Now, if you look at yourselves, if you look at your body, see how everything works. Our body is even so complex. And everything uh, were placed properly. Now, just a trivia for us. There's 11 organ systems of the human body. Those who are in the medical field would know this skeletal system, cardiovascular, etc. Now, these uh, uh, organ systems, they do not interfere with one another. They, they function independently. Also, it says that the human body consists of 70 organs that are highly specialized in performing different functions. Millions of cells form part of a single organ. They work together. Human body contains nearly 37.2 trillion cells and 39 trillion microbes. The brain contains 86 billion nerve cells joined by 100 trillion connections. And this is more than the number of stars in the Milky Way. There are so many nerve cells in a human brain that it would take almost 3,000 years to count them. Wow. You have more than 600 muscles and 200 bones in your body. Bone is five times stronger than a steel bar of the same width, but it is brittle and can fracture on impact. Now, what does this tell us? These figures, these numbers, a complex universe and a complex human anatomy require an intelligent designer, right? So complexity, uh, complexity of design demands an intelligent designer. Now for thousands of years, my dear brethren and friends, all of the known planets that orbit around the sun, they follow a, a, a single pattern that until now they follow it. And for so many years, they are not bumping into each other. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Now take, for example, another example, the human brain. Take, example, our human brain. A question was asked, what makes the brain such a tough nut to crack? Scott Utel of the Center for Cognitive, uh, Cognitive Neuroscience at Duke University said, the human brain is the most complex object in the universe. Now, this just proved to us and show to us that our brain is so complex that it demands, you know, a, a super duper to the highest degree of intelligence to create your brain, to create my brain. So therefore, for the reason of rationality, I would say, it could have not come from nothing. It could have not come from that little teeny weeny small aspect. Okay. Our fingerprints, I'm looking at my fingerprints, are another example. Did you know that there's a research uh, uh, that was made that uh, one in a 64 million chances that you will have the same fingerprints with somebody, but that's not going to happen according to science. If they found out that there is a identical or the same fingerprint 
Chances are, that would be the same person. Right. So can you see, could you imagine the complexity of our being, of how God created us? Now, in the design argument for the existence of God, here is the actual uh, logical argument. Okay, now, the premise number one, according to science, they say that anything that exhibits complex functional design demands an intelligent designer. Now, premise number two, the universe exhibits, even the human body, exhibits a complex functional design. So what's the logical conclusion? Therefore, the universe must have an intelligent design. Designer. Amen to that. Amen to that. Australian atheistic astrophysicist Paul Davis has admitted that the universe is uniquely hospitable, remarkable, and ordered in an intelligible way. He even confessed to the fine tuned properties of the universe. According to Paul Davis, uh, 2007, laying down the laws. Okay. Now, the word. Um, uniquely hospitable, the phrase, it means the earth is hospitable, meaning habitable for life, suitable for life, okay, where life exists, while the other parts of the universe is hostile because there's no life form in them. So that's why he said that the universe is uniquely hospitable. Now, the simple fact is that to deny either the premise, they say, either the premise, let me go back, to deny even those two premises of the design argument is to deny reality. While to deny the conclusion is to deny logic, according to matetis.org. Uh, so the logical answer is there must be an intelligent designer. Okay. Now, in Psalm 139, verse 14, the Bible said, I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, what does fearfully made mean? Now, when you saw, for example, when you saw and held for the first time your firstborn child in your arms, you had that feeling of awe, of excitement, of astonishment, looking at your very own. And it's a wow moment. And probably when you wake up early in the morning at dawn, you go out and you have a quiet moment with God and probably looking at God's creation, you will feel that sense of astonishment, awe. And you could probably feel, you know, chill, a shiver run down your spine. David, when he said that, it was a wow moment for David. It was that same feeling that you felt when you, when you first hold your firstborn. And when he looked at himself, looking at himself, David contemplates how from the dust God created him. How from the dust God created everything. He was in awe. So in awe or in fearfully made, it means that he is, uh, uh, he is awe filled with reverence in front of God, knowing that God is almighty. Now, the phrase wonderfully made means we are created very distinct, set apart, very unique from all other creations, right? We are, we are unique. Now, the New Living Translation of the Bible used the word complex because we are so complex. And science found that out, that human brain is so complex. Human anatomy is so complex. Now notice the word workmanship that's written there. Apostle Paul uses the same principle, uses the same concept in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, a masterpiece. You know, I've searched the word masterpiece. Masterpiece means the greatest piece of work which demands a supreme intellect. 
Now, in all of God's creation, we are His greatest piece of work. We are His masterpiece. Oh, I love that. Amen to that, brothers and sisters. Amen to that. I am a masterpiece of God, and you are a masterpiece of God. Amen. You see how from the dust of the ground, God created you and I. Beautiful, handsome, right? Now, Anthony Flew said, I now believe that there is God. He's an atheist. I now think, now think it, the evidence does point to creative intelligence almost entirely because of the DNA investigations. What I think the DNA material has done is that it has shown by almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangement of which are needed to produce life that intelligence must have involved in getting these extraordinarily diverse elements to work together. Now, Anthony Flew, he died 2010. He was an English philosopher. And for much of his career, he was a strong uh, advocate of atheism. Now, in 2004, he embraced God. He changed his position. And he stated that he now believed in the existence of an intelligent creator of the universe, shocking his colleagues and fellow atheists. Now, it is not wrong, my dear brethren and friends, to inquire about God's existence. It's not wrong. For we are given by God our wisdom, our intelligence. And in fact, the Bible tells us to test all things, to prove all things. It means to inquire, to examine, and prove everything by using your God-given ability, your God-given wisdom. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20, do not despise prophecies in verse 21. Test all things. That's verse 21. So do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Now the word prophecies here in general refers to the message from God. Messages from God. The truth of God's word. Now we are told to test all things. To prove all things. But when you are confronted with the truth of God's words. The Bible tells us. Do not despise. Do not reject it. Accept it as truth. The last time we, we discussed about this, and when we are presented with the truth, we must all accept it because it is the absolute truth. And it says to hold fast to it. Hold fast to what is good, meaning throwing away what is evil works and throwing away false claims. And hold on to what is godly and to what is true. If God doesn't exist, my dear brethren and friends, then there is no point in fearing death. Let me repeat. If God doesn't exist, there's no point to fear death, in fearing death. For there won't be hell to consume us for all eternity for our misdeeds when we die. Right? In that case, whether I believe, whether you believe, there is God. If God doesn't exist, whether you believe or I believe that there is God, nothing is lost in my part. If I believe there is God. All right? If there is no God, if I believe there is God, then nothing is lost with me. But what if, hypothetically, for argument's sake, but of course there is God, we know it. But what if? Just if there is God, there is God, and that hell and heaven is real. Now my question is, who would you think to be at the losing end? Those who die without God or those who die with God? Well, I know your answer would be those who die without God. Now it therefore makes so much sense, my dear brethren and friends, to believe, accept, and serve God rather than not to believe in Him. Amen to that. Now, it is my encouragement to all of us, continue believing in God. And it is my encouragement to those 
who have not yet accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, to those who have not yet believed in Jesus Christ in their life, may you come forward. May you accept the Lord, repent of your sins, and enjoy a wonderful journey and wonderful walk with God. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, there will be a song of invitation. The song is invitation for you to have that union and to have that wonderful journey with Christ. My dear brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. Thank you and God bless us all. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation? Good morning.